our advertising, we know that it's going to peak after, let's say this is six weeks. It's going to peak after six weeks. It's going to die out at 12. And we'll be able to tell the firm, we're going to see the biggest effect on advertising dollars, on sales, in about six weeks. After that, it's going to start to die out. Again, that's if that's the right model. If it's not the right model, if it's the geometric decay model that we're going to come up with, then right, the, the data looks like this. And then we're going to have to calculate essentially what he said, is that kind of half-life. In other words, if you remember your geometric decay, theoretically this goes on forever, for infinity, just like in, uh, just like radiation. Do you know how they date dinosaurs and all those things? What did you say? Carbon-14 date. Carbon date, yeah. And which detects the amount of radiation. So they know how long it's been around by the amount of radiation stuck in the, the bones of the dinosaurs. And they say, so that's six million years old. They're using these kind of models. So what we can say here is, okay, the initial effect, initial impact of the ad is going to be here. And then it's going to decay, and then it's going to decay. And half-life means, literally, when is half of the effect of advertising over? So the half-life is when is 50% of the effect of advertising over? So we can say we can give you exactly that. Look, 50% of the ad's going to die here, or we can give you something probably more relevant, like the nine, not the half-life, but the 90, uh, 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 the point at which 90% or most of the ad has already died out. Remember, this goes on theoretically forever. But we can say, look, this, de this ad, the effects of this ad have, effect, have uh, essentially died out after so many weeks or months. Yeah? You call this a decaying model. What was the other one? It's a parabola shape. It's a parabola. Okay. So, cool. um, so do you have, do you have like a chunk of that picture and then you predict the rest to tell them wh when you think the peak is going to be? We have this whole picture. Okay. We're going to estimate this whole picture. Okay. From a regression. And. And the benefit of that is to tell them for like future advertising campaigns. Exactly. This is what you can expect. So on average, so again, uh, you can say let's just say, you know, ninety percent uh, of your advertising is going to is going to decay after six weeks. So after six weeks, the effect of advertising is done. So you eat, you know. Would you want to start before that? Would you want to let this one reach, uh, this, one, this one kind of die out before you start another one? And so on, those kinds of things. Um, and in addition to kind of measuring the peak effect. Okay, we're going to see initial effect, and then it's going to die, after, die out after a while. Plus, by the way, <clears throat> um, most people won't know whether you're seeing either a bubble effect, a parabola effect, or you're seeing this decay effect. We're going to, we're going to uh, uh, find out a method to actually kind of determine these things and figure out which model to use. And again, because what, you, what, you'll, what you'll find out is most firms don't know. They just don't know how, what the effect of advertising is. You're going to see why today when we see some of the regression. Uh, and we're going to work our way to these models. But it's going to take a little bit of work to get there. Not much. We're still going to run regressions uh, and do tests and stuff like that, but um, we'll figure it out. All right, so that's where we're going. And there's a, then there's some other stuff on changing the trajectory and some of these other things. And the thing I really want to get to is even more sophisticated than this is the stuff that you and I talked about. Are you still interested in? Um, Kind of measuring the effect of uh, so so you've got uh, uh, what is it like Behringer's Founders Estate if they're low low price yeah eight yeah, something like that and they basically got what well, they got they, they probably have a a Chardonnay a Cab a Merlot and maybe a Sauvignon Blanc Sauvignon Blanc so they they've got these this 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 line. They're all similarly priced. They're all really similarly priced. Uh, a couple reds and a couple whites. So I think what we talked about was trying to measure the effect of, okay, 
if I lower the price of the cab, law of demand tells us people are going to buy more cab. That makes sense. But will people also buy more of the of the other brands? So what we can do is look at this kind of inter interdependence, and there's a model we can use, but it's going to take a little bit of time to get there. So, um, so what we want to see is does a price reduction in so we know a price reduction in cab is going to cause people to buy more cab, but does that same price reduction have what we call spillover effects? Does the effect of the, does it spill over into us buying more of the other things? So I'm already here at the Behringer, uh, the Behringer aisle. I'm grabbing the cab because it's on sale. Do I say, well, I'm just going to grab a Merlot and, and a Chardonnay? I'm going to grab three or two or, or something like that. So is there any way to measure that? So what we can do, this is, this is out of the world kind of insane stuff. It's pretty cool. We're going to create something called a impulse function. That's pretty, pretty cool. All right. Zero, positive, negative. And essentially what this does is it allows us to kind of play with levers. It's going to say, look, what is the effect of a shock in the price of Merlot. So we're going to reduce the price of Merlot, and then we want to see if uh, our cab, so Merlot's response to a change in the price of cab. We want to see if there's that complementary. We we'll grab one of these. Yeah, the Merlot's not on sale, but I'm already here to use them as well grab. So I got two Behringer's instead of one. And we'll be able to measure it with, uh, again, this thing called an impulse response function that will kind of show, show something like that. So if that's the picture, then the answer is yes. Boom, it's going to cause, uh, it'll cause uh, a short increase and it'll die out. And then we'll create a, a confidence interval around that and see if that, that impulse is statistically different from zero. Is that the, the question you wanted to answer? Is that what we talked about? I don't remember. It's been a whole summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One margarita is a lot of uh, <laughs> stuff like that, at least for me. So that's what I remember. But again, I could have been hallucinating. Well, you talked to somebody about, was it you, about doing beer in a similar, yeah. Yeah, so this is, this is really cool. And I can tell you this, the reason I'm interested in it is purely self-interested reasons. Um, it's never been done before. So this will probably turn into a paper, and I'll become even more famous than I already am. <laughs> if that's possible. If that's possible. Uh, but I can tell you, I, I've, I've done a lit review and no one's ever applied uh, these, these types of what, what are called impulse response functions to micro level data, kind of brand new data. This is really a, kind of a brand family. Brand, I mean, think about, think about, wow. Um, think about how this would play with brand managers, people whose job it is to oversee that, that founders of state line. Or for, um, uh, Kendall Jackson's got their uh, select, right? Select or something like that. Uh, and so on. So, this is really cool stuff. And it's a natural extension of kind of the stuff I just explained earlier. So, if we can get through this stuff, um, we can get there. And that'll be cool. So, I'll probably get to that eventually, anyways, at some point in time, although I got. Some of the other projects, um, it would be nice to, to kind of do that. So what we're going to look at is something called dynamic models. And again, the word dynamic comes from time. We're looking at effects over time. <clears throat> and we know how we deal with cross-sectional data. Cross-sectional data, we look at scatter diagrams and we try to fit these curves. 
right? We order the x-axis from low to high, and then we see how y changes when x changes, and that's all, yeah, that's called cross-sectional analysis. There's no necessarily particular ordering other than ordering them from low to high. Um, with time series data, we have a natural ordering of time. So we get something like this. We're looking at some variable. We've, we've done this already. We've looked at stuff over time. <coughs> but now we're just going to do things a little bit more methodically and formally. All right. Naturally ordering stuff like this um, over time is going to create some problems. One of them is that things tend to be correlated with each other. And this is called serial correlation or autocorrelation. Things follow trends, which is good, which helps our prediction, uh, which helps with our predictions but it also violates um, some of our regression assumptions. So we just have to be, like I said, it's a good thing. It's just, um, uh, it's something we have to account for in our regressions. And we'll get to, get to that also. We create some, some problems. Um, yeah, but this is, like I said, this is actually good. Consumer behavior doesn't radically change from one period to another. So, to some extent, we can say, look, whatever you were doing last period, you're probably going to do something similar the next period. I mean, even this, where you can see kind of a difference in, uh, it's growing. <laughs> it's growing there, and then it starts to fall. But it's not a one period abrupt fall. It's a kind of gradual change. So if we were to kind of regress a curve in there, it would be, you know, a gradual change, and it wouldn't be just, okay, there's a crash. Um, we still see some movement around that change. And again, this is, this is uh, all good stuff. Um, the independent variables may also exhibit correlation over time. So this is the Y variable, which is, which is let's say, sales of some sort. Uh, our, in, our independent variable is going to be something like advertising. So advertising is going to follow the same kinds of trends as other things. Whatever we advertise last period, is, this period is probably not radically different than what we're going to advertise, uh, what we advertised last period. Um, and again, that's another form of serial correlation. Prices tend to be relatively close to each other in adjacent, in adjacent periods. And these are all good things, but they create small um, problems with our regressions. All right. And here's the important part. Changes in the level of an, of an explanatory um, is likely to have results that carry over in future periods. So, in cross-sectional data, we assume that what happens in this period, what happens at one point in time, uh, is different than happens at another point in time. But when we're dealing with time series data, it makes sense for us to have a memory. We remember things. Uh, we remember advertisements. We remember uh, things going on sale. So how do we account for things that have occurred in the past? It seems kind of obvious. How do we account for things that have occurred in the past? So if, right, if, if we're saying that advertising has more than one period effect, how do I account for advertising from last period? How do I account for advertising two periods ago, and three periods ago? One method is to include lagged explanatory variables. This is pretty easy. So we got y, and we got, so we have y in period t. It's called t today. 
and then we have X advertising today. But we also have X in period T minus 1, which is yesterday, and in period T minus 2, which is two days ago, and T minus 3, three days ago, and so on and so on and so on. And this is how we're going to start looking at things. This model is um, kind of a workhorse in, uh, in analytics. Almost everybody does uses this model, and, it's the, the, and we're going to see the problems with this model. But it's really the model they get stuck with. They're, they're stuck with because they don't know any more sophisticated models, like our parabolic model or our geometric decay model, which are really cool. So this is going to be our workforce. We're going to use this model um, to start with. All right, so the instantaneous effect is xt. Yeah, we know that. Uh, and then the subsequent effects were xt minus q, whatever, however many q's are. Pretty simple model. Uh, one period ago, OK. A second method of, dyna of modeling dynamic relationships is including lag y's. So what this is saying is a little bit different. It's saying sales today, let's say y, is dependent on advertising today, but it's also dependent on sales from last period. And again, what this is what this is essentially modeling is that if sales are following a trend, right? If sales are following a trend, then sales today are probably going to be pretty similar to what sales were last period, right? And that's really what we're saying. So sales are simply following a trend in themselves. There may, <clears throat> there may be effect in advertising. So advertising does have an, an effect. But for a large part, we can say that sales are just following a trend. So we should just include a trend in sales um, in our regression and see how that uh, changes things. And again, this makes sense. Sense to me. Um, yeah, if we think of consumers exhibiting what, what's called uh, persistence, momentum, or inertia, right? it's, hard to, it's hard to get people to move to change their behavior. They tend to, to, behavior tends to stay pretty constant over time. Does that make sense? We're going to use this one too. A third method is including it in the error term. So remember that <clears throat> we get an error term for our I'll switch to an e all of a sudden. Uh, the error term includes all the things in the model that affect y but that we haven't accounted for. So it's things that we either can't account for or measurement error or things that we don't have data on. Uh, so the error includes whatever else affects y other than x. And those things, those unaccountable things, those unobserved things that we can't account for, um, also could exhibit essentially persistence or momentum. So we can throw that into the error term. So we have uh, this period's error as well as last period's error, and so on and so on and so on. And in essence, you can kind of see where the biggest effects are going to come from. Um, if there is really, really heavy persistence, if there's, if our data looks like this, it's just growing by itself, irrespective. Then probably the strong, this is the strongest form of persistence. And it might make sense to use a lag dependent curve. If we think that a lot of that growth is due to kind of cumulative effect of advertising, then it makes sense to use lagged independent variables. 
And if there is some persistence, but it's not real strong, this is the weakest form of, of um, persistence, is throwing it into the air. We're going to use all three. Did you say number one was the strongest example of persistence? Uh, number two, using uh, the dependent variable, a lag dependent variable. Because really what it's saying is y is really a function of what y was yesterday. Right? That's what we're saying. So sales are basically a function of, of EI advertising, but they're, they're also a function of what sales were yesterday. So you want, to tell, you want me to forecast sales tomorrow? Tell me what they are today. So this is the strongest form of kind of persistence in in a time series, like say. We're still accounting for advertising, but we're kind of taking out that trend effect. Because what we don't want to do is kind of attribute to advertising something that would have occurred anyways. Right? We don't want to say that this is entirely due. So if we leave out, if this is our regression, sales equals beta 0 plus beta 1, advertising plus our, plus our error trend. If we run this regression, what we're saying is that the only thing that affects sales is advertising. But we can see that, oh my God, sales are just growing. I and mean, this is like uh, you know, cell phones or something that it's just becoming more prominent in, in, in the economy. So this beta one might appear to be a lot bigger than really the effect of advertising. So once we throw in, once we throw in plus beta two sales and t minus one plus the error term, we might see the size of this thing shrink significantly and become, in fact, statistically insignificant. Again, we would have been attributing to advertising what was actually just a, uh, a, a growing, uh, growing sales. So the sales that were just growing uh, independent of advertising. So we want to isolate those individual effects. And we'll have ways of testing for all this stuff. All right. Boom. Yeah, so rho is just some, basically these rho is the coefficients on the lag variable, so it's like our betas, but it's in the error terms. And it's going to generally be something uh, between zero and one, uh, I'm sorry, uh, between negative one and one. Because uh, normally we see the persistence effect diminishing. go to here. All right, so here's our simplest model. So this is the first model. Uh, this is just using lag values of x. And, and again, this is uh, kind of a workhorse in, uh, in analytics, simply because it's easy. Constructing lag values of our uh, independent variables is, is pretty easy. Um, called the distributed lag model for the obvious reasons. We're essentially distributing the effect of x uh, over time. So x is advertising in period t, which is today, but it's also advertising yesterday and the day before or the month before and, the, and, and so on. So basically it's saying that we don't just know, <clears throat> we don't just respond to what happened, what's happening today, we respond to what's happened in the past. Again, we remember these commercials over time. Um, it's called the finite distributed lag model because we're going to stop at some point in time. We're going to stop including lags at some point in time. There's going to be a finite number of lags. Unlike that geometric decay, which remember is goes on forever. We're going to have to figure out how to put an infinite number of, of uh, Lags in there, but we'll work that out too. All right, so finite or distributed lag model is just including including lag values of x. 
Um, the betas are called the distributed lab weights or delayed multipliers. In essence, it's the effect on y, the change in y, resulting from a change in x i periods ago, holding everything else constant. So it's the effect on y today of a change in x i periods ago. Or you can think of it as, I like guess, rephrased here. How changes in x uh, in period t minus i affect the expected current value of, of y? All right. These are our dynamic causal effects. So beta is 0. <clears throat> and notice um, something uh, minor, but I, I, I did it with with, uh, with purpose in mind. Um, I normally call the intercept, what do I normally call the intercept? So when we write a regression, what do I normally call the intercept? How do I know, no, what's my notation for the intercept? It's beta zero. Beta 1, x1 plus beta 2, x2. Right? Isn't that how I normally write them? Yeah. I changed it a bit here. It has absolutely no consequence other than to try to help us understand uh, the lag. So <coughs> if I stick with this, then this is beta 1. This is uh, beta 1 period t. And this is lag value t minus 1, beta 3 would be x t minus 3. It's kind of awkward uh, in that the coefficient on beta 2 is a one period lag, and the coefficient on beta 3 is a two period lag. Excuse me. See, that's even confusing me. It's a two period lag. You see how that's awkward? So what I did was this, was this. I said, all right, let's just call the intercept alpha. Beta 0, x, t. Beta 0 is the effect of advertising, of today's advertising, on today's sales. Plus beta 1, x, t minus 1. So what I want are these ones to, to um, match. Beta 1 is the effect of advertising one period ago. Beta 2 is the effect of advertising two periods ago. That's all it is. So I changed it so that when we read a coefficient, so if I tell you what's beta 5, it's the effect of advertising five periods ago. You don't have to subtract or uh, like subtracting by one is very difficult, but to me this made more sense. But it does confuse people because they say, oh, wait, wait a minute, where'd you, get, where'd you get alpha? Why'd you start using alpha out of the blue? Um, to me, this makes a little bit more sense. But it, it has absolutely no, um, uh, no effect on what we're doing other than the notation. I just want the notation to be clean. I want beta 2 to represent a 2-period lag. I want beta 3 to represent a 3-period lag and beta 5, you represent a 5 period lag, and so on. So, this is what we have now. <coughs> beta i is referred to as the uh, interim or intermediate multiplier. Measures the change in y resulting from a unit increase in x t minus i periods ago. Prior 
Or you can say the effect of an increase in I, in Y, I periods in the future. Long run or total impact is just adding all these up. Yeah. Pretty simple. Um, I'll try to work one of work one of these problems. All right. So we have a, this uh, <clears throat> finite distributed lag model. And again, we haven't specified how many lags, but, but, but that's fine for now. So suppose x and y have been constant for the last q periods. And x is increased by one unit, and then returned to its original level. So this is a one-time temporary increase in x. So um, let's say you've been spending $100,000 on advertising this, in this one period you're going to spend 150,000. So it's a one-time increase, then you're going to go back to the normal, uh, back to the normal rate. It's Super Bowl, or something like that. It's some big event. We just want to see what this one-time increase in advertising is. So it's not that you're not spending any, uh, you're not spending any money on advertising, and you all of a sudden spend money. That may be true, but it could be that you're spending a constant amount of money, and you decide to increase it once to see what happens, which is what firms do all the time. Uh, They'll, they'll experiment and say, okay, let's just increase advertising and see what happens. See if it has some discernible effect. And essentially what you want to do is, we're going to ignore the, the, the error term, is try to, uh, try to capture that bubble in advertising and see how it, how it works its way through to um, sales. So we increased advertising in period T. One period later, in period t minus 1, y increases by beta 1. So y t plus 1 increases by beta 1 units. Two periods later, um, y increases by beta 2. And this occurs until um, period t plus q when y in that period in the future increases by beta q units. And then in the period in the t plus q plus 1 period, y returns to its original level. This is kind of confusing. So let's do this. Let's start with the simple model. Two period lag model. So what we're saying is that X has, uh, has a distributed lag effect, but it only lasts for two periods. So the effects, of, 